Hey guys, so today we're going to talk about learning, memory, and emotion. So this is Sebastian again. Hope you guys are ready to learn because we got a lot to go through. And it's been a while since we made a video, but we're just going to get straight into it, alright? So, the first thing that we have for you guys today is a case study. So following a childhood blow to the head, Henry developed severe seizures. 18 years later, still experiencing debilitating symptoms, he underwent an experimental procedure that removed sections of his medial temporal lobes, which included most of his two hippocampi. So something that you guys should be thinking about is, what would happen if, uh, if your hippocampus was injured or removed surgically? Um, what symptoms would Henry be experiencing? So think about what your hippocampus does, hippocampi just being, being plural for uh both sides of the hippocampus, left and right. And what symptoms would you experience when, when that was injured? So think about that for a little bit. I'll give you guys a little bit to discuss, and then we'll come back. So at this point, uh, if you guys are discussing, go ahead and pause the video. Uh, and whenever you guys are done, go ahead and press play again, and it'll resume with only two seconds left until the white box is removed. So, uh, the real question is, what is amnesia? Because some of the symptoms that Henry will be experiencing is amnesia. So, amnesia is basically forgetfulness. So, we're going to continue talking about this in the next slide. So, because he had amnesia, he basically could not create long-term memories. So, he might, be able, might have been able to create some short-term memories, but nothing would actually follow through. And that means that every experience that he had going forward was like having a brand new experience all over again. So whenever you hear the word amnesia, just think of the inability to create long-term memories. Now let's talk about the limbic system. So the limbic system is a system within your central nervous system that um, is largely responsible for a lot of these intrinsic human behaviors. You might have heard of the amygdala and fear. Um, it controls a lot of behaviors and sexuality and things like that. Um, so let's talk about it. My mom would never let me drink the Hawaiian Punch. Um, anyway, long story short, I stopped drinking Hawaiian Punch for a long time, uh, almost 10 years before my grandpa went back to like buy Hawaiian Punch again the next time he visited. Uh, and he visited a, long, a lot of times in between, but he just stopped buying uh, Hawaiian Punch. So 10 years later, I tried that Hawaiian Punch again, and as soon as the drink uh, was in, on my tongue and I could taste the Hawaiian Punch, a, a lot of memories just soared back into my mind of me being a kid and the apartment we used to live in and, and all these old memories just because of the taste of Hawaiian Punch. So you might be able to think of a certain smell or a certain taste or a certain sensation, maybe a certain sound uh, that will bring back memories of a specific time. So just by thinking of that, you can kind of guess, uh, understand that memories are associated with other things. Uh, and that's important. So certain smells will be associated with certain memories, certain sounds and tastes will also be um, associated with certain memories. And this also gets me to the point of fear. So a lot of emotion is, is strongly tied to memory. So your amygdala largely processes fear. So whenever you're scared of something, uh, th that memory will be ingrained uh, in your brain because of the large amount of emotion that was associated with it. So think about something that scared you a lot as a kid or recently um, that you can't forget. Uh, and that's a pretty you know easy concept to get around, right? And hopefully you remember your neuroanatomy. Uh, so the cerebral cortex is that, you know, the pink squishy stuff you saw in that brain model from the neuroanatomy video. Uh, and that cerebral cortex, uh, or the cerebrum, has four major lobes. Um, so we have the frontal lobe, which is in the front part, obviously. We have the parietal, which is in the top part. Um, the temporal, which is kind of like inside of your ears or on the, the level of your ear. And then we have the occipital bone, which is in the back, which is associated with eyesight. Or with visual association, I should say. Um, all these different regions, they'll, they'll process different information, but they, they also talk to each other. So they process in sensory information like smell, taste, sight, sound, uh, and also all those regions that are associated with that will integrate into memory as well. Um, so there's two different types of memories here uh, on the screen that you can see. There's declarative memory and there's semantic memory. So when it comes to declarative memory, this is like data. This is very analytical. It's, it's facts, it's data, specific events. 
um, things that are very just explicitly there. Okay, so you're declaring something that must be, that was, right? Um, this can be a semantic or episodic type of memory. Now, semantic is cultural knowledge. They are ideas, so they can be more abstract. Uh, they're things that you've accumulated over time that aren't necessarily super analytical. They're not numbers and, and things like that. Uh, so in this case, you could, as an example, it'd be the names of the state capitals, which I'm sure you've been tested on in your high school career, um, as well as the names of important people, the definitions of words, uh, and things like that. So those are the differences there. Uh, start to come up with some examples and maybe share some examples with your classmates uh, and ask your teacher about what other examples could be. If you happen to be watching this online or not in a classroom or anything like that, any setting like that, you can also look up more examples on the internet. So Google would be a good use or resource. Um, the next slide is the episodic memory slide. So episodic memories, think of your favorite episode from your favorite TV show. There's a specific setting, there are specific sounds, um, specific things that you can see um, in, your, in a specific area. So an episodic memory is a, a unique representation of a personal experience, which includes all of those factors that I just listed. Um, the emotional connection, like we were talking about before, the emotional connection to memories is largely responsible for the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system. And the amygdala is usually associated with fear. So any type of very, very scary event you probably really remember pretty well. Um, this is the... the, the Part of our brain that modulates the fight or flight response okay so whether or not you should stand up and fight or if you should just run away uh, in order to save yourself so the parahippocampal region uh, also aids in the hippocampus in encoding the what of episodic memories rather than the where or when okay so another th interesting thing about the brain is that we really don't know how much space we have for long-term memories so basically we don't know the the full extent of the capacity of the human mind to hold information. Um, this is not the same for short-term memories though. So short-term memories are limited to small sums of data for a limited time. So if you have a friend or you make a new friend and they give you your, their phone number or their Snapchat or their Instagram or whatever it may be, you might be able to memorize you know, the, the name, number, or username for maybe a couple hours, um, but you don't necessarily remember it a month later unless you actually see it over and over again so it's a temporary form of information holding that doesn't always get sent to become a long-term memory um, some aspects of the working memory are uh, done by the prefrontal cortex which you can just think of as the basically in the frontal lobe area uh, and these sections kind of spurt out information they kind of go in bursts uh, which we think is has to do with keeping things active or online and so once those neurons stop firing in that same manner those memories are essentially gone. It's also important to note that working memory is a temporary type of declarative memory. So basically it's a form of short-term memory that lets you hold on to something small like the phone numbers we talked about. So there's other types of these declarative memories or working memories uh, and they kind of help us navigate around the world. So imagine you walk to the school into your school, your high school, for the very first time. Things probably seem very, very new. You don't know where things are. You're kind of lost. You're asking for help to find your class. But over time, that changes, right? So now you probably know if you're in your fourth, third, or fourth year, you probably know the school like the back of your hand. You've been in almost every room. Uh, you know where some teachers are and where uh, if other teachers are in other buildings, you know where the cafeteria is, uh, all that stuff. Um, so this is a type of spatial memory which is a form of declarative memory. So basically this was shown or identified in studies that show discrete areas and even individual neurons within the brain uh, which are dedicated solely to the processing of specific types of information, in this case the spatial awareness type. Um, so, so now we get to my favorite type of memory which is non-declarative memory. This is also known as an implicit or procedural memory, and it's stored and retrieved without any conscious effort, meaning that you don't really have to think about it to do it. Uh, the best example that I can give you guys is riding a bike. I'm sure we all remember the first time or first days or weeks that we were trying to learn how to ride a bike, um, and we just kept falling and falling and falling. Uh, but now once you get good at it, over time, especially at the age that I am now, I've been riding a bike for so long that... It doesn't take me any thought, really, to balance on a bike and then just ride it. 
Um, you know where the controls are, you know how to balance yourself, you know how to pedal faster, pedal slower, go up hills, things like that. This can be retrieved without any conscious effort. It just You just know how to do it because you've practiced it so many times. This is the same as shooting a basketball. You know, the difference between shooting a basketball for the first time and uh, a, a basketball player in the NBA like Steph Curry or Michael Jordan um, who've shot a basketball so many times that they don't have to think about what they're doing uh, in order to do it at the highest level. So these are non-declarative memories. Now, if we think back to the case study, um, the fact that our, the, the man in our case study and other people with amnesia show deficits in certain types of memories, but not all of them at once, would imply that different types of memories are stored in different anatomical locations, um, but they are some, uh, sometimes associated with each other via certain connections. And so these memories are not all in just the same location. That's important to know as well. So different types of memories are encoded in separate but interacting interfaces. Now, our ability to learn and adapt over time is, be, uh, is because of our synaptic plasticity. Um, our environment can often change, uh, and the environment that you consistently put yourself in will constantly change, right? So the going from middle school to high school was a pretty big change, but you learned how to navigate through the new building, right? You learned how to navigate through the material that is taught at the high school level versus the material that's taught at the middle school level, these kinds of things. Uh, and these connections can remodel themselves to form new and more relevant synapses, which is how we form new long-term memories. So if you've never ever you know, played a sport, but once you start playing a sport and you get good at it, that is a type of non-declarative memory. But then let's say that you, sh you switch sports. Let's say you were playing basketball because it's my favorite sport. I'll use it as an example. And then from basketball, you're shifting to soccer. Now, basketball is largely done with the hands. A lot of the, the high-level skills are done with the hands. Not to say that the feet aren't relevant, but shooting a basketball, passing a basketball, catching a basketball, these kinds of things. In soccer, you would have to use your feet. Uh, and this type of switch can be very difficult at first, but over time, our synapses will change and learn. They'll overcome the, the challenges and they'll adapt as long as you put it into practice long enough. So think about that the next time you want to learn something new. All it takes is the amount of hours and time of practice in order to get it down. So don't be discouraged about learning anything new, including neuroscience. So encoding a new long-term memory involves persistent change in the number and shapes of synapses, as well as the amount, and this is important, the amount of neurotransmitter released and the number of receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So if you are, if uh, imagine a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. If the posts, uh, the, the presynaptic neuron releases more neurotransmitters, this is at a higher concentration, which means a higher percentage uh, and higher probability of the receptors co making contact with the neurotransmitter, uh, which means the signal will be stronger. Similarly, if the postsynaptic neuron has a larger amount of receptors for that specific neurotransmitter, now you can largely affect the intensity of that signal because you, you, the, there's more neurotransmitter and more receptors associated with that. Uh, meaning a, a much stronger connection. So now let's talk about how neurons will talk to each other. So the easiest case to kind of explain this is with two neurons. So there's one neuron that comes first and then a second neuron that comes second. So we'll call that the primary and secondary neurons. And we can also call them the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron respectively. So pre just meaning before, post meaning after, and then synaptic is in reference to the synaptic cleft, which hopefully you guys remember is that small little space about 10 nanometers long, I believe, um, within the synapse, um, which is where neuroplasticity comes from. So it's coming from this synapse where a signal can be stronger or weaker depending on how many receptors, on how many neurotransmitters, and things like that. So the presynaptic neuron uh, if there's an action potential that is induced, that electrical signal will pass through the axon, and once it gets, it gets to the axon terminals, that electrical signal will be converted into a chemical signal. And these chemicals are neurotransmitters, and they're transported in tiny little vesicles at the end of the axon, and that will eventually be released into the synaptic cleft via those vesicles. So those neurotransmitters will be released into that cleft, the synaptic cleft, and hopefully they will make contact with or attach to a protein receptor that is on the postsynaptic neuron. 
Now, the more neurotransmitters, the stronger the signal, and the more um, the more protein receptors that are on the postsynaptic neuron, the stronger the signal. So once those proteins make contact with the receptors, the neurotransmitters make contact with the receptors, that will induce a cascade of effects that would eventually lead a chemical signal to change into an electrical signal. And that is what keeps that electrical impulse going. Okay, so that's basically in a small little nutshell how neurons talk to each other. Um, this goes into further detail in the book, and you can go ahead and read this paragraph that's on the slide. Um, but that's definitely something that's incredibly important, especially when it comes to studying the formation of memories, the strengthening of memories, and the strengthening of motor function. So whenever you're learning something new and trying to get better at something, that this process, which would be called long-term potentiation, becomes very important. Okay. So here on this slide, we can see the schematic of the synaptic cleft, the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. So if you look all the way to the right, where there's a big yellow kind of rod making an impression on that gray surface, uh, on the bottom left of the image, you see the synaptic cleft, which is where that yellow axon terminal will meet up with that next neuron. Now the vesicle is there. So if you go all the way to the top of that right picture, you can see the nerve impulse. That nerve impulse will eventually lead into the end of that axon, which is where those vesicles are. And those vesicles are filled with neurotransmitter molecules. Then those vesicles are transported to the end of that, the distal part of that axon, and released into the synaptic cleft. Um, so that axon terminal uh, of the presynaptic neuron is where those neurotransmitters will be released. Now if you look past the synaptic cleft and you look at the next neuron, there's a couple of pink protein receptors. Those are looking for the neurotransmitters or are waiting to be in contact with them, which leads you to the pictures on the left. So you see that green little neurotransmitter and that pink receptor? That allows for sodium to be uh, to funnel in, so it's a sodium gate channel. And once that neurotransmitter connects, the sodium can enter. When the neurotransmitter is released or degraded, or partially degraded, sodium can no longer enter. So this is how that electrical signal, signal can propagate. You're essentially changing the membrane potential by allowing more sodium to enter. So there are two opposing but equal processes which are key for synaptic plasticity. So just to kind of get a, our definition of synaptic plasticity on the same level, this is basically meaning that you're changing the synapses and how they form and what they're connecting to. So you're changing the, sy the synapse or the synapses. Um, so there are two processes that help us do that, and that is LTP and LD LTD. Excuse me. So LTP is long-term potentiation, um, which is long-term, hence the name. And then LTD is long-term depression, which is also long-term. So depression, uh, don't confuse this with kind of like the emotional side of depression, although it could lead to something like depression, I guess. But um, that's not the major point of this. The long-term depression is basically the reduced effects of the neurotransmitter on the, on the neurons, basically rendering the signal weak or essentially useless. Whereas long-term potentiation will increase the signal. And one thing that's really important for this is calcium. So calcium is going to be essential, and so is glutamate. So glutamate is actually the most prevalent neurotransmitter in the mammalian nervous system, and it binds to several different kinds of receptors. Um, basically, these, these processes will physically change the way our brains are formed, uh, and this is what leads to adaptation. This is what leads to us learning new skills and retaining new or different memories. Um, so long-term potentiation, meaning that we're increasing the amount of NDMA and AMPA receptors, uh, which will increase the effects of the neurotransmitters. Um, LTD is the opposite, which would decrease the effectiveness of the synapse. So please keep these in mind. They're both important in reshaping the way we think and reshaping the way we move and all the processes that let us adapt to our environment. So now that we know that LTP and LTD are different, um, we can kind of dig further into why and how they differentiate into the e efficiency of neural impulses. So LTP is going to boost the concentration of calcium ions in the postsynaptic cell, while LTD will also do it, but to a much less degree. Um, 
the different concentrations of calcium will activate different enzymes. So in the terms of LTP, more kinases. And in terms of LTD, that's going to be phosphatases. Uh, and these will change the effectiveness of the neuron to carry the electrical impulse. So efficiency is going to matter because a less efficient neuron will likely, you know, either form a different a synapse or just be degraded through apoptosis. Whereas a very efficient neuron is going to be continuously used and that neuron is going to be healthy and alive for a, a much longer time. So in addition to the continued stimulation uh, of these action potentials and long-term potentiation, um, this repetitive experience activates CREB. So CREB acts in the nucleus, which is going to basically be uh, what regulates the genes inside the nucleus of the neuron, which is going to uh, stimulate the production of newer proteins, which we call protein synthesis. Um, among the many proteins produced are neurotrophins, uh, which stimulate the growth of the synapse and structural elements, which will stabilize and increase the sensitivity to neurotransmitters. So this cascade will go back all the way to the DNA inside our neurons and express genes that will create proteins that are going to increase the sensitivity of them. And that's how the cycle works. So you get a signal, the signal gets stronger by this effect of gene expression, which will then create more proteins which increase the sensitivity of that neuron. So in the 1970s, an anthropologist named Paul Ekman identified what he called the six basic emotions. Um, so there's anger, there's fear, there's surprise, disgust, joy, and sadness. Um, and there may be other emotions, but we're just going to assume that these are the only ones we have to know for now. Uh, feel free to look up any other emotions that um, you may find interesting. But for now, just pay attention to these. Now the brain structures, some of which we've already talked about, which are closely linked to the emotions, are the amygdala. So if you ever think of amygdala, you've probably thought of fear. The insula, um, which is a, the part that is uh, kind of like the folded part of the cerebral cortex, um, just within the lateral sulcus or the sylvian fissure. Uh, and the periaqueductal gray, or periaqueductal gray matter. So just outside of the, uh, the aqueducts, or what we call the ventricles, there is some gray matter, um, and that's where this would be located, which is in the midbrain. So these parts of the brain, basically the, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the insular cortex, they're going to have projections to the periaqueductal gray matter, um, which in turn has reciprocal connections with the central nucleus of the amygdala, uh, the projections to the thalamus, to the hypothalamus, to the brainstem, and then even deep layers of the spinal cord. So it's very easy to see how if there are projections from these parts of the cortex and then leading into things like the thalamus and hypothalamus, how emotions can actually dictate our hormonal regulation. So remember that hypothalamus is the part of the brain that kind of helps regulate certain hormones. Uh, and so being angry, depressed, or super excited and surprised can actually change the way we feel via these uh, emotional hormonal responses. So if you've ever, ever taken a psychology class or like maybe AP psychology, you may have heard of classical conditioning. So classical conditioning is actually very dependent on the function of the amygdala. Um, which is associating a stimulus with a reward or a punishment. Now, through the insula, uh, you can actually uh, experience disgust, which is a strong or negative reaction to things that are very unpleasant. And, for example, odors. So if you have spoiled milk or spoiled, uh, you know, just food in general, you can smell that and that'll, that'll give you a feeling of disgust. That's processed by the insula. So the in insula is pretty cool because it's uh, believed to take in system-wide inputs and generate subjective feelings about them, um, which is basically linking your feelings and internal physiological states, social emotions, and even conscious actions into your emotions. Um, so this is the reason why the way you feel can definitely affect the way uh, you think and physically act. So there's a, a huge wide range of inputs that the insula will receive in order to create this emotional response. Now, the periaqueductal gray actions and, and reproductive behaviors as well, um, which is also associated with anxiety. So anytime you get stressed or feel pain, uh, you may feel anxious. Um, this is usually associated with that periaqueductal gray. So now that we're basically done with the material, I wanted to take a little bit of time to review what you should know, uh, what kind of resources you could use to uh, enhance your understanding. Um, and so number one is definitely to read the Brain Facts book chapters. So uh, our PowerPoints are based on those chapters, as well as some other supplementary information, but definitely 95% from Brain Facts. 
um, go through the PowerPoints and review. Uh, you can even use our YouTube channel to read uh, to rewatch some of the videos that we've sent you guys. And you may want to use YouTube to uh, look for other types of videos that may be useful resources. Just make sure that you're checking your source. So don't just watch any random YouTube video. Make sure that the person you're learning from uh, is like a doctor, has some type of degree, um, or is just a center for educational section. So there are many of those, um, but just be careful what source you're using. Um, so other things that you should know are differences between diseases. So for example, Alzheimer's versus Parkinson's versus ALS versus Huntington's. What are their similarities? So what are they all characterized by? Um, you know, how do they affect neurons? What neurons do they affect? Uh, their treatments, which include, it includes the drugs and what types of surgeries are potentially available for them. Um, please understand senses, touch, pain, and how those receptors are associated with, the, with your everyday life. Um, go over movement. So if you can, uh, memorize some of the general muscles we have. For example, the pectoralis major, the biceps brachii, the hamstrings, the quadriceps, the glutes, uh, the erector spinae or the erector spinae muscles of our back. Um, know those uh, and some of their basic functions so you can kind of understand movement in a more broad sense, not just the neurological uh, you know, nerve to muscle sense. But also please understand how the reflexes work and how the nerves will communicate with the muscles through the monosynaptic reflex, um, which includes voluntary and involuntary muscles. Uh, so know the difference between what muscles we have uh, that are voluntary and which ones are involuntary and how that differs. Um, today we did emotion learning and memory. Um, so please review that so that you can get some things into your long-term memory. Uh, and then basic neurobio, so action potentials, the anatomy of a neuron, the different cell types like the neural glia, uh, and then you, just your basic you know neuroanatomy like the lobes, the fissures, the sulci, the gyri, and things like that. Okay. So anyway, I hope you guys learned a lot. I hope this helps, and we'll get with you guys again for another video, and we'll see you at the next Central Florida Brain Bee. Have a good one.